Good afternoon. We thank the, um, the organizers, particularly Dr. Coleman, for inviting me here. It's, it's, it's been five, five years ago that I, present, I had a presentation here as a fellow uh, abstract winner. So that being said, uh, my task today is somewhat easier, but I'm going to take you through uh, some of the newer treatments in CLL. I've taken this poetic license, if you will, to cut across disease types and talk about CLL and lymphoma. So I was inspired by Dr. Uh, Peter Hillman's talk uh, on, on the whole genome sequencing to come up with a patient that I saw and that puts things into, uh, con in the context. I had a patient about 60, 62 years old uh, um, who has had a uterine cancer a year later, developed CLL with P53 mutation and Notch1 mutation at the time of diagnosis, had the worst RSV infection along with Pseudomonas infection at the same time, uh, and had complex cardiotypes. So what are the treatment choices? So this is sort of the patient scenario you, keep, you have to keep in mind as we go along with this presentation. Of course, I, I, this is always the uh, three-pronged approach as we are learning towards uh, getting towards the, the, uh, the, the personalized therapies, if you will, trying to understand the biology and adapting the new treatments. You also heard uh, uh, Dr. Chesson speak about the end of chemotherapy. While we are not there yet, at least the newer um, uh, drugs out there, we've had the very good past years and many more to come in CLL. Uh, a lot of those have brought dramatic changes, but also new challenges. And it's in this context, keep the patient's history and presentation, and I want to talk about these few points and efficacy of the newer agents and how the second generation and third generation do a better job, the promise of toxicity. And you'll see that some of these new drugs actually seem to have a better toxicity profile, durability, uh, which I think is a big question mark because you, you don't want to leave uh, the patient with a $130,000 uh, yearly tag, uh, with a sticker, no, more than a sticker shock. And of course, immune activation. So of course, uh, future directions, we will talk about three drugs, oral agents, the ACP196 and the TG1202, and of course, the venetoclox while we finish up with checkpoint inhibitors and how they all seem to or may come together in CLL and lymphoma. So this is reminiscent, this slide is reminiscent of the TKI era uh, with imatinib when we started looking for second and third generation because of the toxicity, because of the off-target effects, the mutations, and this is the Ohio State that Dr. Allen showed earlier on. Uh, even though the CLL, the retrospective study showed that the patients progressing from CLL were f uh, few, there were other events. Patients were intolerant to the drug because of toxicities, and also there was this rictus transformation, which is a big problem. And so in this context, we'll talk about these two agents, the BCR pathway inhibitors, the second generation. The, the first that I'll talk about is acalabrutinib. And you all saw this data of acalabrutinib. Uh, Dr. Furman and uh, his colleagues, uh, Dr. Bird, uh, had a presentation uh, uh, and also a paper in New England Journal in January this year. Acalabrutinib, or ACP196, is a highly irreversible, uh, potent BTK inhibitor. It binds to the, uh, the BTK C481 very tightly. And it doesn't have the off-target effects, like binding to EGFR or ITK signaling. And this is the New England Journal paper data, which showed about 95% overall response. All of them are a partial response with lymphocytosis. This is at a follow-up of about 14 months. What I'm going to show you is the uh, ASCO data, and I think uh, Dr. Furman is going to update this in, in ASH later this year. So this, the, the, as the dose cohorts went up, there were also a set of patients who were newly diagnosed with treatment-naive CLL. And if you look at the characteristics of these patients, there were about 61 patients. They were uh, had high risk, bulky disease, majority of them with a mutation 17P and uh, a mutated, uh, unmutated IGVH. And the dose that is chosen finally was 100 milligrams two times a day because it was able to maintain the BCR inhibition continuously. And you can see the side effects were well, not that, that many. A, a few headaches, grade three, grade four, n n almost non-existent, some diarrhea and arthralgy, as opposed to the first generation ibrutinib. And if you look at the oral response rate, it is about 97.2%. All partial responses with a few PRLs, and, uh, and there were no progressive disease. More importantly, there was no rictus transformation. Of course, at the time of ASCO, this is uh, the follow-up, median follow-up was about 10 months and uh, very impressive data. So that is acalabrutinib. What about uh, the PI3 kinase uh, inhibitors? Uh, we've heard about that this morning, but there is this second generation PI3 uh, delta isoform inhibitor called a TGR1202 from the, uh, the TG Therapeutics. 
It is highly selective. It only binds to the uh, Piatri kinase delta. And uh, Skip Burris uh, presented this data in EHA in 2015 uh, and across the B-cell malignancies and showed an impressive response in CLL, particularly those patients who took more than 600 milligrams. And the safety, it's very light compared to the, uh, the other P3 kinase uh, inhibitors. You do see some um, uh, uh, colitis and, uh, of GI, GI toxicity, which is diarrhea, but not real colitis, as was seen in the first generation. And when, the, when, the, when they com combine the TGR-1202 with ublituximab, which is a TG therapeutics anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody, the response has doubled, and they saw an impressive 64% response in a highly refractory patient population. So, so there's more to come with this PI3 kinase delta inhibitor. So the conclusion with these uh, BCR inhibitors uh, is that you have a better toxicity profile, or at least a promise. The, sh the follow-up is short, but you, know, you have to wait to hear more about it. Now, when it o'clock, so you heard a lot about it this morning from uh, Dr. Furman. Uh, just to remind you, it goes through uh, the uh, BCL2 pathway. BCL2 is the quintessence of, uh, of uh, resistance in B-cell malignancies and the small molecule inhibitor for the longest time. Finally, we have one that targets it very finely and increase the mitochondrial instability. So this is, uh, slide is just to show you that it is so potent that uh, the, we had to come up with a dose ramp up. And also I want to tell you that one of the thing, other points is that you have to pre-select the patients into the, uh, who might be at a high risk for uh, tumor lysis syndrome using the Cairo Bishop formula. And those with the high risk, obviously the ones that you have to admit and possibly give them IV fluids and respiricase. So I'm going to show you two phase two studies, which is already alluded to uh, uh, to some extent, but I just want you to focus on the depth of the response at this time. And Venetoclox monotherapy, this study was a Lancet Oncology publication which led to the approval, Dr. Stilgen, uh, Stilgen Bauer's paper. Uh, you can see the response rate was about 80%. But if you look at the CRs of more than 10% and the, and the measurable residual disease, uh, or the minimal residual disease as the case may be, was more than 20%, so with, in this relapsed refractory po population. The other uh, sec uh, phase two study was in the relapsed refractory setting, in the setting of uh, TKI failures, whether it is ibrutinib or idelalisib. About 65% of them who failed this went on to receive this uh, venetoclox. And pay attention to the depth of the response. So the responses were pretty impressive. 65% responses in ibrutinib and idelalisib prior therapy, and about 54% responses in ibrutinib refractory patients. So very impressive. Though if you look at the idelalisib arm, it seems like it's uh, about 17% of oral responses, and the reason is this, because the duration of response, the, uh, the patients who went on uh, to receive venetoclox with a prior idelalisib had a shorter follow-up at the time of this ASCO presentation. So you'll hear more about this. So it's pretty impressive that venetoclox is able to overcome some of the, the resistance to the first-generation TKIs. So MRD. The minimal residual disease is very impressive. The, at the 24 weeks, the, uh, about 23% of the patients achieve this. And this is very important. I'll, I'll make the point in a second. But in about 48 weeks, it's about a year, you see about 50% of them achieving minimal residual disease. And if you add a second agent, anti, uh, CD20 monoclonal antibody or chemotherapy, the CRs double, the MRD doubles. And so that's what my patient went on. She went on a study with venetoclox and obinutuzumab, and I was able to, able to achieve a response for about a year until finally recently succumbed from rictus transformation. So in conclusion, venetoclox is the first agent that has activity not just in 17P, but also in TKI-resistant uh, patients. The depth of the response is higher. For the first time, you can actually stop this drug, and many of these patients continue to maintain the response. So let's change gears to immunotherapy. And this is again another patient, another patient of mine, 21 year old with Hodgkin's lymphoma, after uh, having failed five different therapies, came to me with the hip pain. You can see the, uh, uh, the hip lesion and the right axillary mass with the hemoglobin of eight and um, alkaline phosphorase of 400. We put him on the nevolumab study at the time. This is after two treatments, not uh, two months, but just two treatments, week one and, and, and then week three. You can see that the axillary mass, you can hardly palpate the axillary mass, it's gone. And after four months, uh, the patient is in complete remission, and now 18 months later, continues to be in remission. So very dramatic responses in Hodgkin's lymphoma with uh, PD-1. So 
So of course, this case illustrates a, a point that I didn't mention. He received radiation just before going on nivolumab, and very likely he had what's called as the abscopal effect, which we are starting to discover and understand in many lymphomas. But I want to point out to you the immune system activation requires two signals, signal one and signal two. And typically, it works very well. That signal one is a TCR with a peptide. The signal two is a bunch of co-stimulatory molecules. But the cancer cells seem to have uh, ways to block the signal two either through CTLA-4 or through PD-1. Through work done by Dr. Jim Allison and Dr. Honjo, antibodies have been discovered that block the PD-1. And there are three different kinds. And you just focus on the IgG4 variety, which blocks the PD-1. You have the pembrolizumab and the Nevo, and the IgG1 engineered, which mostly uh, are a target of the PD-L1 ligand, which is the atazolizumab and dur dur durvalumab. And so I want to show you these two studies quickly in Hodgkin's lymphoma. The, um, the Keynote 13 study, Dr. Moskowitz presented this data. Uh, was uh, pembrolizumab in patients who had prior therapy for, uh, with uh, classical Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, given at 10 milligram per kilogram every other week. And this the NEVO study was very similar, uh, presented by Dr. Steve Ansel, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. The dose here is three milligram per kilogram uh, uh, every two weeks. You can see the side effects, and it's a common side effect profile. There are some um, GI toxicity seen, but clearly there were some uh, immune-related, on-target immune-related side effects such as pneumonitis that is uh, seen in a small percentage of patients, uh, including nephrotic syndrome. But if you look at the response, it's very impressive, the waterfall plot. In the first study, 65% uh, overall response rate, and in the second study, uh, and in the duration of response also maintained. And in the second study, almost everybody responded, 100% responses with 87% overall response, including CRs and PRs. And, and the durability of response also, was also pretty long. One of the reasons why the, the PD-1s work well in Hodgkin's is because of this. This is sort of the snapshot of all the PD-1 L1 expressions in different tumor types. While the corporate wars are going on on which drug works well, in Hodgkin's lymphoma you don't have a problem because the expression of PD-L1 is pretty high. And, and the, there is over-amplification of this chromosome 9P24. So obviously, it's, so to summarize, the PD-1 inhibitors, Nevo and Pembro, uh, have a very promising activity. And how does that lead us? Uh, today, I think in most malignancies, you're looking at anti-PD-1, PD-L1, plus your favorite treatment. That's the future of cancer therapy, one way of looking at it. So there are three different uh, examples that I'm going to give you. One uh, example is what Dr. Heslop and Dr. Bollard have done in the last few years, take the patient's own uh, autologous T cells, uh, treat them, uh, with, uh, sense them with peptides, and come up with uh, cytotoxic T cells. And what happens is when you do that, they activate PD-1. So this study is just starting with, the, uh, with combining the autologous T cells with PD-1. And the second study, we heard a lot about Richter's transformation and, and also allude to the fact that Dr. Peter Hillman showed some of those patients had a high uh, a tumor burden. So this Richter's transformation protocol is from Nitin Jain, combining nivolumab with uh, ibrutinib. You'll hear more about this in ASH. There's an oral presentation, so I'll leave that at that. And the fusion study is a study with Celgene with durvalumab, lenalidomide, ibrutinib, chemotherapy in various combinations. And it's just going to begin uh, trying to look at all the various aspects, not just in CLL, but also in lymphoma. So in summary, with uh, the second generation agents and also with immunotherapy, we have seen the dramatic efficacy. The toxicity profile seems to be better. There's a promise of lesser toxicity. There's durability of response. For the first time in CLL, unlike CML, we're thinking of stopping the medications. Immune activation has it's rejuvenated the whole idea of, of getting to the holy grail of treatment. So combinations in the future, uh, stay tuned, and I think I'll stop here. And uh, thank you.